We're gonna kick off with a quick round of introductions and I'm actually gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves. I didn't prep you for that, but just you know your background best. Um, Dustin's nervous, he can go last. <laughs> um, ask you guys to introduce yourselves and how you relate to this topic. Um, you know, whether that's through your professional job today, what you're doing, et cetera. So um, introduce yourselves starting either maybe at Claude, and we'll come this way. So, hi, everyone. I'm Claude Grunitsky. I'm, I'm a diverse uh, fund manager, and I'm an asset allocator, so that's how I Woo! relate to, uh, <laughs> We're into to this it. topic. No, I run the Equity Alliance, which is a VC fund of funds, but also direct investor that I started with my longtime mentor, Dick Parsons, in 2021. And my background, I was a founder. I had created a media company called Trace, uh, when I was in my early 20s, and um, Trace was funded by Goldman Sachs, and I sold that company in 2010. After that, I started um, a teaching uh, at Harvard, but also mentoring a lot of young entrepreneurs, and then I got a call from Dick Parsons who said, let's uh, diversify asset allocation. Let's do it. Absolutely. Batul. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Batul. I'm a principal at K4 Capital. I am primarily focused on direct investing, especially in the economic mobility sector. So fintech, future of work, as well as justice tech. Um, and, you know, as many of you may know, k Capital's thesis is about investing in tech-enabled businesses that close gaps of access, opportunity, or outcome for, for low-income communities and or communities of color. And I guess how I relate to this topic is, you know, I come from those communities and I've kind of seen the products and services that are needed to really move the needle um, for certain communities and I wanted to be a part of moving money into the communities to where it actually moves that needle. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the sentiment. Um, so my name is Dustin Shea. I'm the director of the Impact Labs at the Sorensen Impact Institute. Uh, in that role, I help to build partnerships to support a VC apprenticeship program that's designed to create more equitable pathways into the field of investment allocation. Uh, I've come to this work actually as a student that went through that program about 12 years ago um, and then spending about eight years in the interim helping to scale up a group called Village Capital that really focused on the who, what, and how of venture, right? Who's making investment decisions? How are those decisions being made? What kinds of capital structures are we using to enable um, companies that are starting to solve some of these really big environmental and social problems? And the reason that I've come to this work in this way is that I view those as kind of the, the major barriers that are keeping VC from harnessing the power of entrepreneurship to really address these problems. And if we are trying to invest in problems that disproportionately impact certain communities, we need to be investing in people from those communities who are most familiar with those problems and most familiar with the kinds of solutions that will scale within their community. Great. Hi, I'm Liz Roberts, Head of Impact Investing at Mass Mutual. We're a large American life insurance company, and in Impact Investing, we have a sort of a two-pronged strategy that's addressing um, inequality and capital access, specifically to advance racial and economic equity, and that's split between uh, direct investments through a Catalyst Fund 1 and 2 that invest in companies, and then also a first fund initiative that invests in first-time diverse fund managers, um, but funds zero through four emerging managers. Doesn't have to be fund one. Um, and I came to this work, it was actually a really windy path, but I uh, was a tech entrepreneur myself in New York City in the early 2000s, built and sold a couple small tech companies. And in my experience uh, with investors, with fundraising, there was never anyone who, who looked like me. There just weren't a lot of women. Um, and there also weren't a lot of out LGBTQ folks either at that time. Um, and so then once sold that, started angel investing, then got curious about venture capital and just access to capital. Uh, everything from built some accelerators on different models around that to doing some policy work with the Obama administration on access to capital, who gets it, where it goes, why, uh, which led me to my work at Mass Mutual, where I've been about two and a half years uh, leading the impact investing. Fantastic, thank you all. Really excited to share the stage with you. Um, also aside, I noticed while we're sitting here, Dustin, are you wearing the same outfit as in your headshot? I always do. <laughs> <laughs> every panel, every time. That's awesome. <laughs> Taking a uniform to the extreme, I love it. He's got so much brain space today for other decisions, everyone. Come up and talk to Dustin. Um, 
Wonderful. All right, to kick us off, um, I know you all shared just a, a little bit um, from the personal side about how you got into this work just now. This question is more about the institutions that you've either founded or you work with. So many reasons why we might want to diversify who makes asset allocation decisions. What's your ultimate goal? What are you aiming at here? What are you trying to accomplish? Why do you do this work in this way? Anyone want to kick us off? Fatul. Yeah, I'll go first. So, I mean, I believe venture capital with all of its wealth and power really influences the ideas that are valued um, and thus the products and services that end up getting funded um, and ultimately the products and services we all use as a society. So I think in the simplest sense, if your team is not diverse, if your VC team is not diverse, if the folks that are, uh, if the LPs are not you know, allocating their money in diverse funds and there isn't that trickle down effect, there can really be missed or overlooked opportunities um, within this space. There can be poor outcomes um, just for society at large. And if you're not representative of the population that you are serving, I think that's such a miss. Amen to that. Is it less than 2% of female founders get venture capital in the country? It's not because 98% of the great ideas come from men, right? Crazy idea. Um, but the reason that I come to this work and, and what we're doing at Sorensen Impact is a little bit different, right? Like we've been able to create a portfolio with, um, and just to call it like we see it, right? A not super diverse team that is over 66% women and people of color, which is very, very different from what you see in kind of traditional venture capital. Um, now that said, like the, the reason that I come to the work around um, trying to do, drive like long-term better outcomes for a society through venture and trying to change this system to make it work better is because when you look around politically, you see a lot of the challenges that we face as a society we've got kind of deadlock on how we think we should solve them. Some people think deregulation, some people think new larger government programs. Similarly on philanthropy, you see a, a challenge of a lot of people doing a lot of really, really great work, but disparately and sometimes um, duplicatively because they wanna put their name on something and say, I did this, which is also totally fine. It's their money, they can do pretty much whatever they want. But if we have those two major tools kind of tied up, in some kind of deadlock, then there's a role for business to be used to actually drive positive environmental and social outcomes. And unless we take the time to really focus in on harnessing the best aspects of this particular tool of business to address or at least reduce suffering and increase flourishing, um, then we're really missing out on an incredible opportunity to drive the change and the development of the society that we want to live in. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I have a, a slightly different perspective um, it, because it, it's very much driven by my own lived experiences. When I was 30, as I said, I, I raised a $15 million Series A from Goldman Sachs, and I was a first-generation founder. At that time, I was still an immigrant. I, I didn't have a green... I had a green card, but I, I wasn't yet an American citizen. I didn't really have anybody in my corner that I could lean on. And the kind of investors that I had at Goldman were, as you can imagine, very much focused on a specific type of ROI. But my media company, which I'd started in my bedroom, was very much driven by the power of hip hop as a subculture and the potential that hip hop had to change mindsets around the world, coming out of black culture, but then permeating into other cultures through the prism of music, film, fashion, art. And the investors had no idea what I was talking about. So in a sense, I'm doing this because I want to be the investor that I wish I had when I was a 30-year-old founder trying to find my way. And, and, and at the time, there really weren't any diverse um, uh, in, investors in that VC space that we were operating in in New York. Um, and I'm bringing the corporate perspective. So the work Impact Invest is doing is really deeply aligned with our business objectives and our customers. So we're a mutual company. That means that we're, we don't have shareholders. We're actually owned by our policyholders and our customers. And that's been Mass Mutual's governance and structure for the last 170 years. And our tagline is to secure the financial future for all Americans. So we invest to address inequality as a systemic risk for 
our economy, our society, and our policyholders. And we do that by, we like to focus on investing in generative uh, social and economic mobility innovations that are built by and designed for the economic majority or everyday Americans. And so we really think about that in terms of, you know, there's a, or to put a finer point, there's an over-concentration problem in venture capital in the majority of the dollars going to a small homogenous percentage of the population. Well, that really gives a narrow lens of perspective on market opportunities, problems to solve, and end users through your lived experience. So we really see it as an incredible advantage, especially if you take into consideration that by 2050, 54% of the United States population is going to be non-white. So you must have a diversity aspect to your financial, you know, your investment thesis and your portfolio construction, or you're missing out on key opportunities and you've, you've got a risk. Um, so that's the perspective we really bring. I love that reframing, Liz. This is one of the moments when Liz shared that on our call that I almost stood up and cheered, you know, hearing, hearing someone say what has always been true but is only just now coming slightly to the forefront, that inequality is a systemic risk in our society. Right? We need to address it or society won't exist. Right? We won't make it. Um, and companies like Mass Mutual are really recognizing that. And I love to see that. I had a question in my panel the other day about big companies and, you know, these huge companies have these efforts around equity or, or uh, inve you know, social kind of socially minded investing. Like, do they really mean it? And when I hear Liz talk about Mass Mutual, it's so clear that Mass Mutual really means it. Right? This is not some kind of marketing ploy. This is de-risking a business for the future of all Americans. Um, I really love to see that. Fantastic. Um, we're you know, we're going to start here on an optimistic turn, but we're going to pair it with where we see some gaps too. So you know, I, I think so often when we talk about equity or inequity in the system, we can get really caught on what's going wrong and what doesn't exist yet and what didn't exist when I was an entrepreneur, when Claude was an entrepreneur, when Liz was an entrepreneur, right? But, but I wanna start with some bright spots. So where do you see bright spots? What's going really well? And then pair that if you want to or we can come back to you with where you see gaps. I know for some of you those things feel like two sides of the same coin and in other cases we can come back to you, but bright spots and gaps. Sure. I, I wouldn't say a bright spot for me that I've seen um, as a fund manager in fundraising is that there's an educational process that's taking place in communities of color. And by that I mean that the whole concept of investing is something that is still a process even for professionals and investing in the right way. And what do I mean by that? In my own personal journey raising Fund One for Equity Alliance, I was able to raise, in pretty short order, um, around $28 million. Mostly, I want to say 99% were white male investors. And, but then I realized I needed to diversify my cap table. So I reached out to my friends who were uh, lawyers, who were accountants, and I said, you really should think of investing in funds because that is potential wealth generation in the future. If you look at the returns that have come from venture over the past three decades, it would make sense. And I was surprised that even qualified, certified public accountants would tell me that they would rather pay off their mortgage early than actually invest in funds. And I didn't realize there was such a gap in what I'll just call basic financial literacy between people who have grown up with wealth and have benefited from the power of investment and compound returns, and people in the black community, Latino communities that I operate in, who just weren't thinking that way. And so I was very proud that we were able to actually diversify our cap table by attracting some diverse investors as well, but it's still an uphill struggle. The battle is still, is still being fought now because the mindsets that we grew up with were not necessarily about saving in the right way or putting money into mass mutual. It was a totally different approach to just managing money and thinking of posterity and what we now all call generational wealth. 
Awesome. So do you see that as an ongoing gap or you see that more as a bright spot? Mm. I think it's a bright spot because those conversations were not certainly not taking place. Um, when I was a founder, literally no one ever told me about QSBS. I had never heard of it, right? And so I would have saved, when I sold my company, I would have saved a couple million dollars if I knew about save, you know, QSBS. And just very basic things that are not commonly shared in these communities because sometimes money is still taboo because the fragility of just existing and surviving is still something that is very real to many of us. And so as a result, projecting long-term and thinking of building wealth through investments in funds and, and, and different kinds of asset classes is still a pretty new conversation, and certainly the communities in which I operate. Yeah. yeah, so maybe two sides of the same coin, right? It's starting to happen, that's a bright spot, and you're still seeing a gap at that level when you go to A raise. huge gap, yeah, but, but huge maybe gap. it's not as huge as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> if we're gonna be po uh, positive and optimistic. I love that, I love that. The bright spot may be small, the gap is huge. Uh, so lots of opportunity out there, um, fantastic. Anyone else, bright spots and gaps? Well, I, I think one yeah. of the bigger bright spots is like the, uh, the amount of intentionality that we're seeing across high-level LPs on focusing on diverse managers and across the manager spectrum on including an inclusive approach in their own thesis and explicitly reaching out to communities um, like accelerator communities and other kind of centralized hubs of sometimes regionally or industry or demographically driven entrepreneur support organizations to be able to ex explicitly drive that community connection that many venture funds just don't have. I mean, at the end of the day, I know that we're trying to make really strong progress and our program is part of trying to make that strong progr uh, progress, right, in terms of increasing demographic diversity. But even when we're looking at venture funds that don't have that representation already, we're seeing them reach out to groups like the Black Innovation Alliance to say, hey, I know that there are entrepreneur support organizations that are around that are sourcing and supporting and de-risking these early stage investments that I'd really love to take a part in. I just don't know where to find them. Can you help me actually engage? And you start to see people overcoming their own perceived pipeline risk. Now we all know in this room, the pipeline risk is not a real thing. There are many founders of color. There are many founders from underrepresented backgrounds that we can and should be engaging with. But for the folks that have used that as a pretty thin veil for a long time to not really stretch themselves to be able to get that actual deal flow. There's new systems in place to help them navigate that ecosystem. That's on the kind of tops down approach. On the bottoms up, there's our program, the VC Apprenticeship Program, which has been going for about 12 years, but there's also this plethora of newer programs that are around. Some of them are six years old, some of them are three years old, some of them are like last year, right? There's groups like the Black Venture Capital Consortium, there's groups like HBCU VC, there's groups like Black VC, right? That are really focusing on driving that demographic diversity by giving people the perspective, the skills, the network access that they need to be able to achieve at least the first rung kind of entry point position into eventually becoming the decision makers that understand where capital is actually going to go and make that decision um, as they continue in their careers. Not to put too sharp a point on it, but you know, this is why we called it tops down and bottoms up. You hear Claude talking about education at the level of the LP, right? Walking into rooms where people are saying, I've never, I don't think venture capital is for me, even if they're qualified investors, even if they could, and doing education at that level. And then you hear Dustin talking about it, education of college students who thought, I don't think venture capital is for me, right? They're saying the exact same thing in different settings and saying, hey, let, let's go, take you through a training program. Maybe it won't be for you, that's okay, um, but, but maybe it will be, and if you have exposure to it, connections within the industry, it, it might be the right route for you. And so diversifying from the tops down and the bottoms up. Go for it, Patu. Yeah, and just to add to kind of what Dustin said, I mean, so I think there, so I'm just gonna talk about the bright spot, but um, <laughs> I think in the last few years there have been a lot of conversations around you know, what kind of structures or frameworks can we have to add more people to our team that can rep have you know, a diversity of experiences, thoughts, you know, racial diversity, all the things. And I think, I mean, it's really interesting. So Brian, 
uh, Brian Dixon partner at KPOR, so he wrote an article about two to three years ago um, just talking about how folks, you need to have more diverse check writers, and that's really going to make a dent. And so first round capital actually, for the first time hired their first, and, and credited Brian to this, had added their first black partner to the team for an open process. So they put, so one of the things that Brian had mentioned in his article was, no one's gonna know about these uh, positions, whether partner, principal, whatever it is, if you don't have an open process. You know, a lot of venture is, you know, like I'm gonna talk to Dustin and I'm gonna tell him, hey, I have an opening on my team, but it's just gonna stay within us, right? And so if you're not publishing that and opening it up to other folks who, are, who don't have those relationships and don't have those networks, it's really hard to get diverse folks, you know, who otherwise would, you know, want to be in venture but don't have the opportunity to be in to get in those doors. And so, um, so I would say like there's a lot of conversation structure in place for that. There's more scout programs that help train folks, um, you know, to get, to get a, you know, get a faster, I would say, track record than otherwise they would have. There are more, um, I would say, community organizations like Black VC, Latinx VC that are also helping train their peers. Um, there's NDCA, there's EVCA, there's so many other groups, um, you know, for to help you know with the training and mentorship that's needed, um, because venture is an apprenticeship model. Um, and the one other thing that I'll say is, and I'm also a product of this at KPOR, is you know, a lot of groups are starting to have a summer associate program and really expanding that to include other groups that are not from the Harvard, Stanford, Wharton bunch, right? And so, you know, KPOR Capital, I'll just plug in ourselves here. Um, we've had a program for over 12 years now, um, a summer associate program. So Brian Dixon, he, is, he was a summer associate back in the day, and now he's a partner at KPOR Capital. Ulili, who's our other partner, actually hired Brian when she was an analyst, and she started this program 12 years ago. And so I, you know, joined the summer associate program program in 2019, and then now I'm principal. And so it's really allowing black and brown folks to get into tech and now venture capital, right? And that's kind of the bigger mission. Um, and we have over 100 alumni that are in, in different, I would say, VCs, but also in places like the Ford Foundation or other you know, groups um, that we like to co-invest with as well. Awesome. Love that as a bright spot. I'm getting excited. Are you guys getting excited? <laughs> it's 927 now, so we can start to wake up a little. I've had more coffee, thanks to Martine bringing me a chair. Um, Liz, bright spots. Yeah, I think bright spots are just the sheer um, size of the opportunity and volume, right? The talent is particularly on our first line side of these emerging diverse GPs is unbelievable. We are swimming in deal flow from incredibly talented, diverse managers with incredible backgrounds who are starting funds. Um, and that influx has just been awesome. So, and, and it's also an answer to one thing I, you know, I probably respond to at least weekly in my work is people say, well, are there even enough, you know, talent for filling what you're investing and, and what you're trying to do? And I have to smile and nod and say, you know what, it's actually, it's not a pipeline problem, it's a process opportunity, right? So that equity is as much about process as it is about the outcome. And I really love, you know, listening to their panelists talking about the different processes that are needed because in the status quo process, because it's either you're just talking to your friends um, that tend to all be homogenous and also have a lot of money or what happens in venture, um, is that you really open up those opportunities and being really intentional to widen the gap. And so we've unequivocally proven at this point uh, there's a very robust pipeline, for example, in our scope of what we're looking for for funds. We had an initial just 50 million that we were hypothesis testing, and in that we said, we've identified 300 funds in scope for exactly what we're looking for that represent 15 billion in investments they're seeking, right? So then we were awarded another 100 million. Mass Mutual was like, yeah, keep going. And so it started as a small hypothesis proving the pipeline because, you know, crunch base, pitch book, they don't really, or some of them just recently, ask demographics, right? They'll tell you where you went to business school, but they won't tell you anything else about the founder and what that looks like. And so the excuse of, well, the reasons the numbers look so low for diverse managers and GPs are because they're just not out there is just unequivocally, you know, false. 
And so we've really seen that bright spot and so many fund managers coming into market. So that is incredibly exciting to us. And I love what you said earlier about, um, you touched on process and how the actual deals get in front of VCs. And that's something that I think is really important to sort of double down on. A lot of us have been talking about the allocators as opposed to the allocation and how we are actually deploying capital, but KPOR is actually a group that completely normalized a totally different approach, which is obvious when you think about it, right? But just having an open application on your website to say, we are investors, we are looking for these things. If you fit these things, please submit something, a deck, an overview of your business model here so that we can evaluate it. And I remember when you guys came out with that in like 2000, 18 or 19 or something, it was like, everybody was like, oh my God, how could you possibly deal with all of this deal flow? It's like, literally, that's your job. You're an investor. <laughs> like, so, sorry, you have to do your job. Um, but We copied what you did, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and we do that now too, right? We're a financial corporation, and if you go to massmutual.com slash impact investing, you can directly apply or find out more if you fit the criteria as a, as a company or a fund. Guys, I can't tell you how excited I am to hear that. As an impact entrepreneur years and years ago, I can't tell you the sleepless nights I had figuring out who I knew, who knew somebody, who knew somebody, who knew somebody who might be willing to introduce me to this person who I thought was an amazing fit and should meet me. Right? Their job depends on meeting people like me, and I still couldn't always find the right connections, despite having two white male co-founders who went to Stanford. Um, you know, that it's, it's a challenge, so I, I love that from across the board, guys. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Well, a couple of you touched on bright spots without talking about gaps, and I do think talking about gaps in this room is super important because we want to know where those opportunities are, where those action points are. And I know, you know, Claude, you started with a small bright spot and a huge gap, but if you have other gaps to add, feel free. Um, but we'd be curious to hear, you know, what you all think about where the gaps are today. There's, there's still a huge perception problem. Like, and, and across the field, when you start thinking about or talking about either if it's about impact or a demographically driven investment thesis, immediately the first question that comes up is like, why wouldn't you consider a white guy investor? Well, like, maybe there are other funds that will consider a white guy founder for X, Y, or Z problem, right? Um, but that perception of that as an additional risk instead of the acknowledgement of that as a strength of an understanding for the target community for a problem that you are looking to solve is a really stubborn problem that we're, we're still struggling with. Even though we see k Capital and others putting up top, deci or top quartile returns um, from 2019 and from other vintages of their funds, right? Like you're still seeing people saying, well, I don't know if you can possibly invest with an inclusive thesis and be able to drive high returns. Even though the Sorensen Impact portfolio, 66% women and people of color is beating VC benchmarks by 1%, right? Even though we don't have a demographic focus at all, um, we're just looking for the best deals, like there's, there's still this really stubborn perception in the community that um, either impact or inclusive approaches are concessionary models. I love that. I think we heard that across everybody's commentary. The perception and the reality are different, right? You know, Liz is hearing, well, is there really enough out there? You can do a little test. She's swimming in deal flow, right? Um, there's so much out there. So perception, perception versus reality is a, is a really big deal across multiple axes of this problem. I do want to say, though, as um, you know, I, have to, I am and I have to be the cheerleader for the Equity Alliance and for the fact that we only invest in women and people of color. But I do have to say that over the past couple years, a lot of fund managers just kind of jumped on the bandwagon. What do I mean by that? I have met with over 300 fund managers, and you know, I'll just say it, many of them are just fly-by-nights because they kind of just see an opportunity to get management fees. And then when you start asking them what specific skill set they bring to the specific thesis, you know, some people just get stuck. And it just became a really fashionable thing to start a VC fund in the last couple of years, specifically also for diverse founders. And just because we are repping diverse founders and repping women 
and repping people of color doesn't mean that we just have to open the floodgates to just anybody who wants to start a fund. Mm -hmm. And so the work that we do uh, collectively is really about being extremely discriminant so that we can identify the people who really do have a spe specific skill set and who actually want to build an institution, not just a fund. You know, who want to get to fund three, fund four, fund five, mm -hmm. as opposed to let me hop in and hop out and make a quick buck and, and then somebody else might be left holding the bag. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Mm. I, I double down on that so much. And if I see like another seed stage generalist fund and when you ask a fund manager, like what, what are you actually looking for in a company? Like, they're like, oh, it's my process. I do my process. I'm really excited. It's like, well, what is the process, right? <laughs> they're like, uh, 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 and, and then you find out it's the feel good only fund, right? And it's like, I don't know, I don't, I don't really, think that that's like a really strong investment opportunity. There are absolutely undervalued, overlooked, untapped founders and fund managers that are out there. And there are also fund managers and founders that are out there, to your point, that are just trying to build on the popularity of this particular moment in time. And it, it kind of undercuts the whole idea that we're going for, because a lot of investors are going to, LPs and allocators are going to invest in some of these funds, maybe even first time LPs who are trying to say like, this is my shot, you know, I am I believe in this person because they showed me this really idealistic vision, and then they're gonna have a bad experience, and then they're going to, it's the same thing that happened in early impact, right? Um, they're going to attribute the problem to the full asset class or the full demographic of founder instead of that they had a bad decision-making process, right? And then, and then I'll just maybe just really quickly just share perhaps a little factoid. I can't tell you how many fund managers I met in the year 2022 who said they were solving for the future of work. I mean, it's like, you know, the number of decks that we're about, we're gonna solve, I'm mean, like, what, what do you, what specific angle do you have on the future of work? Is it future of income? You know, and then now they're stuck, you know, because future of work is going to be the El Dorado, the Holy Grail. And yeah, so Liz, on to you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have stories to share. Your, your turn. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there, I mean, there always is a lot of noise in every market. Um, I think what we really look for, and, and one thing I get frustrated with is, you know, that perception, right? And that, you know, impact investing in general, people hear concessionary returns. And you're like, no, nope, I'm seeking risk-adjusted market rate returns, and I smile. And then they hear race, and they say, that's so fantastic, you're out of community responsibility or philanthropy. And I say, no, we sit in investment management or investing you know, out of the, the general investment account. Because when you start to bring in race, that's sort of a race, that's all they sort of think, and then bring their own judgments to that. And that's one piece of the demographics for all the reasons I sort of listed of like, we believe the best talent can come from an area where we know if our portfolio doesn't look like the US census, we're missing that talent. But there's so much more that goes into a very thoughtful investment process, right? What is their differentiated thesis? What is the unique uh, lens these founders bring to their background? How are they sourcing deals? How do they relate to entrepreneurs? What is their back office skills and portfolio management? What's the team they put around them? Are these, because we also want to seed the, you know, the financial institutions of the future. This isn't a one and done charity product. We are building a platform. We write our smallest check we can write is $5 million. We write five and $10 million into these fund managers and they go through the same operational due diligence process as anyone else at Mass Mutual, whether you're a BlackRock coming in or something else, you have to go through the same process. And so that's intimidating, and for our sub $100 million funds, we invest in funds from 25 million to 250 million. And why that's a big range for a financial institution like me, you're typically completely invisible if you're under 250 million, because we're not gonna bother to write a check less than 25 million. So you go through this, but we have a workbook with our ODD that goes to it, and it's, it's a laborious process. <laughs> you can ask any of our uh, first uh, you know, fund um, managers. Um, but at the end of it, they sort of have a workbook that's, so you be SEC compliant for a $100 million fund. But it's a lot of things that aren't expensive to do. It's like, what do you do when you're gonna wire cash? We're like, well, I call my bank. Well, no, you email a partner. It's so much about cash control and compliance to make you really institutional ready, but most institutions don't take the time. So we go deep 
with a very small handful of funds. Unfortunately, that's our process. Um, you know, we probably work with four to six funds a year we actually close on because it's a very laborious uh, process, but for all the right reasons. We're an insurance company. We're 170 years old. We have a very high you know, risk threshold, but what's been good about this process is that if you get our stamp because it's our cash, but we also leverage our, our reputation, right, our social network, uh, sometimes even our intellectual capital and all of those things to tackle this problem. So the going deep and demystifying the fact that we're just like giving away money is like, no, this is a very intentional process and how do you empower them for the future? My, that was a lot, but my problem is, or my downside of the gap is there aren't enough other LPs alongside us in the market. Despite the fact that $100 million funds this size perform really well, regardless, despite the fact we could paper to the moon and back that diverse teams outperform, the cash doesn't follow, right? And so I think that's our real frustration is finding more LPs to help finish these rounds, and that's gotten you know worse in the economic environment recently. So um, to any allocators in the room who are curious, we'd love to open source our process. We'll tell you how we do it. It's not a pipeline problem, it's a process opportunity. Um, and so we're just really excited to bring more folks along. Um, and we're actually hosting an LP-only power hour tonight, trying to collaborate with more folks to think about this um, alongside, if you're an LP or you're an allocator who are diverse manager curious, go see my colleagues Tomash or Chris right there. They'll, uh, they'll help you get there. Fantastic. Quick follow-up question, Liz. After you go through that long, laborious process with a first-time fund manager, you make them institution ready. Are you seeing follow-ons from other institutions? I know you just yeah. said that was your gap, but also like... We are. We're actually seeing a very good, what we call sort of graduation rate, because that's mm. our goal. And even something like a family office will add a zero to the end of the check, because now they're going through, oh. if they're mass mutual compliant, this kind of goes to a different echelon of readiness and credibility. So. Oh, I love that. I love that. You see a million dollar check go to a $10 million check to help fill out a round. Exactly. That's awesome to see. As a reminder, if you have questions for any of our incredible panelists here, feel free to just turn, turn your head around. David's in the back in the purple shirt. He's got cards and pencils. He can pass them out. He'll collect them then from you and bring them up to make sure we get a chance to address. Oh, we got lots of questions coming in. Fantastic. Um, keep, keep writing your questions if you have them. Wonderful. Um, one last question from me before we turn to these questions coming in from the audience. Um, what are some unexpected challenges you faced while implementing your strategies? I'll just say quickly, you know, trust, right? It sounds really obvious, but there's a lot of distrust of financial institutions for good reasons and under allocated communities. And so a lot of communities, particularly after you know, the murder of George Floyd, who started these funds or these initiatives, and then didn't deliver, right? Or didn't know how to or weren't thoughtful about how to service um, these kind of managers or CEOs. And so I think really walking the talk and building trust takes time, takes intention, takes purpose. And it's not that we didn't know that, but just how important um, that factor is. I, I double down on, on trust being essential to be able to go through the process of building a bottoms up approach to creating access to this industry. Um, there's also something insidious that's kind of happening even at um, institutions that are making direct allocations and have been very forward about their commitment to investing in people of color. And that is that there will be newly somebody on their investment team that is like, ah, oh, this is the person who handles deals that are led by people of color. And then you end up with this like very strange problem where their ability to evaluate companies that are led by people of color is limited by the capacity of that one principal or that one senior associate. And anybody else at the firm, it's like a two-sided problem because anybody else at the firm who tries to evaluate these companies, that person's like, hey, no, I'm the person that does diversity. And it's like, what? <laughs> and then on the other side of the, the coin, the problem is that um, all of the entrepreneurs that are looking to actually engage with that firm, whatever firm it might be, um, are, are 
sort of shuttled over to that one person, you get this like extended timeline where all of a sudden their next call availability is like three months out and your round is closing in like six weeks. And you've got this terrible challenge of, um, and, and not one that it immediately would come to mind if you see like the public announcements of, oh yeah, we're here, we're ready, we're making allocations, right? Um, but it's a, it's a really big challenge that you see in the space. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I have two things, one for top down, one for bottom up. I mean, when you're direct investing, I feel like sometimes the words impact investing can be so buzzwordy and they mean different things to different people, right? Just depending on who you're talking to. And, you know, I've had folks, you know, tell me like, oh, well, you know, no one's competing with you guys, right? Like, you know that, like you are the nonprofit of VC, which is not true at all considering we just raised a 125 million dollar traditional fund and as a, you know being stewards of capital like i have the same metrics and benchmarks and you know i i feel like i almost have to scrutinize a deal even more because i'm looking at positive outcome but i'm also looking at is this venture scalable and so You've got extra yeah. that you have to do. <laughs> yeah, so just from that side, it's like, how do you build a coalition of partners that actually believe in what you're doing and, you know, are on the same page, you know, as you and as, you know, the cap tables that we're on. And so I think from that side, it's like really a push and pull between like, what are we actually doing here and almost convincing other people of that goal. Um, and then just like a quick story on the other side, you know, we just raised $125 million uh, close last year and we raised on the, I would say, heels of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, everything that happened the summer of 2020. And, you know, I think that was such a catalyst event for folks to start investing in and having mandates to invest in black emerging managers and folks of color. And, you know, as later as we got on in the process of raising, you know, maybe our third close, fourth close, there, you know, we had one of the LPs tell one of our partners like, oh, well, I don't have any more black money for you. And she she was like, well, I'll take your green money. Like this is the same type of fund, you know, that we're raising as, everyone else, you know, and you can point to our impact report, you know, of Dustin mentioned, like, you know, our um, investments are at the, you know, on par with funds of the same size, and we're on our third fund. So imagine, you know, I can just imagine when emerging managers are, you know, starting out, don't have that much of a track record, like what an uphill climb that can be. I, I really uh, want to build on, on what you s just said and kind of dovetailing, because as a managing partner, my job <laughs> is to raise money and for, Fund one, which uh, I ended up raising in 2021, still riding that kind of George Floyd um, uh, wave. It, 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 I, it raised it in pretty short order because there was real demand. But again, that was a proof of concept fund one. And as I said, we want to become an institution in this space and we feel very well positioned to become an institution. And then when I started talking to large capital allocators, endowments and very uh, respected institutional investors who actually reached out because we had two separate full page articles in the Wall Street Journal about you know, what we were trying to do to, to, to democratize access to capital. Literally, these conversations started in 2021 and around the spring of 2023, many of these conversations just stopped because you know, after we went through the whole song and dance and, and everything, they just realized again that you know, they needed to cut some asset, um, um, you know, allocations within the VC space. And of course, the diverse managers were the first to get cut. And that was extremely frustrating because the only way we can advance to the next stage is if we get the imprimatur of these very large um, um, asset allocators. And so I feel like that was a moment. And I'm just wondering if those people who just paid lip service to that moment, the racial reckoning, um, and the, and, and the movement for just kind of gender justice, if they will actually come back or if there was just something they needed to say as a public statement in that year in order to be on the quote unquote right side of history. Yeah, you saw a lot of those kind of ineffectual commitments, right? Where there was a commitment to say, I'm going to develop this massive, and particularly on the part of corporates, this massive commitment, I'm going to invest in all of these first time fund managers, but there was no intention ever to have that go from first time managers to their second fund, to their third fund. 
That's one of the things that's been so exciting to see about Mass Mutual's approach and your ideas of making sure that as you're investing in these first-time fund managers, you're also following them for fund two because that fund two to fund three before you're no longer considered a, an emerging fund manager after fund four and you're still you know, getting started, that's such a, a challenging spot. It's like the same challenge that you see for direct startups as they're going from kind of their friends, families, and fools or really pre-seed kind of round, <laughs> right? to their series A, that opportunity gap or the valley of death, depending on your like level of optimism, right? It's the same challenge that you're seeing just at the fund level. That leads right into our first audience question that I'm gonna get to, and we're gonna be picking and choosing, so I apologize if we don't get to your question or to all of your questions, because some of these cards have multiple questions on them, but please keep turning in questions. Um, if you have them, David's at the back, he's got more cards, pencils, pens. Um, this is difficult because you all just said this was a major challenge, but how do so many funds that raised their first fund on the heels of George Floyd, how do they raise their next fund when those allocating capital no longer care about diversity? Any tips or tricks? Like, I don't know if this person is a fund manager, but I'm just be curious. Anybody has thoughts? I think it's gonna, it's gonna be difficult, and I'm in it right now. So our fund one is doing very well, from a multiple and invested capital perspective. I mean, our very first direct investment in Isuzu became a, a newly minted unicorn within six months. You know, 15x return in six months doesn't happen every day. But what I'm finding in conversations with LPs as I raise fund two, they're asking me about distributions. Mm. Like, we only closed the fund in December 2021, <laughs> and you already expect distributions it's 2023, in, in September right? 2023. <laughs> You know, mm. and the bar is that high. So it's just a very polite way of saying no. Yeah. And I accept that. Uh, but I, I feel like there's a bit of a double standard mm. still. Mm. And it's really frustrating. So unfortunately, because there haven't been as many exits mm -hmm. as we would have hoped or wanted or expected, I, I think years. a lot of people are not going to be able to raise their second fund. Yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's just the reality of what's going to yeah. happen. And unfortunately, it's hitting at a market time where I think people are becoming more anxious for liquidity, right? I'm hearing that across the board. Folks who are very committed and all in in 2020, 2021 are now saying, I kind of need some of that cash back. <laughs> um, so that makes it a lot harder uh, to be going back to the market. Anyone else have thoughts or advice other than it's just going to be really hard? I mean... Uh it is going to be really hard. I think everyone's going to say that it's like obligatory to say it at this point. It will point, be, yeah. Right? Raising a fund is always um, hard. It will be harder. Harder. It is hard already. It is hard. <laughs> and, it's, it's, and it's only gonna get worse. But like the, <clears throat> the opportunity that we have or that I've seen for fund managers is to talk about other metrics of success. You talk about multiple on investment capital, which is a great, very standardized way of measuring success, but how Closely, are you tracking your um, your your planned disbursement? How closely are you following that? How many deals are you seeing that are actually spectacular that you're able to get into? How much are you improving your process? Because one of the biggest things that I think LPs are looking for when they're looking at a fund two is what did you learn during your fund one, and how are you improving as a manager in order to be able to. Um, warrant a, a follow-on investment. And while I know that many of those kinds of things are, are basic questions, I think a lot of them are getting lost with the idea that like, oh, you're no longer interested in diversity, that's fine. You don't have to be interested in diversity. You're interested in the metrics of my fund that show that I am a better and better and better investment for you. I love that. I would just quickly say, because it's specific advice, just from a corporate perspective, the liquidity issue in the macroeconomic environment is really real. Um, you know, venture is, and venture is sort of gonna suffer in PE and general equity investments are, you know, they just have a higher capital charge when we look at sort of our whole portfolio and risk and how we evaluate it. So there's just gonna be less dollars going into the asset class as a whole. Um, but I was really encouraged, I'll reference another session in case people missed it yesterday, of capital on the sidelines. I was like, you're gonna have to replace some of those LPs, but what Fidelity Charitable is doing, right? They have 300,000 DACs, those donor advised funds. They have five specific impact buckets. They gave out 11 billion 
last year, right? And so looking for if you're impact aligned or what are those things, some of those other capital sources that have are gonna become more crucial as you replace some of your LPs. Oh, that's Liz, can I just yeah. interject really quickly? Yeah. I can't imagine that Mass Mutual has liquidity issues. We, is, is that a reality? Are we living is, in a world where Mass Mutual would have liquidity issues? Well, I mean, no, but it's a risk <laughs> issue, right? It's liquidity. You need to keep certain. So how the insurance industry works, right? So we have, we do, we're large. We have about $300 billion in market cap. The vast majority of that, almost 70%, is in fixed income, because this is insurance, right? We have to make sure we have liquidity to pay our policyholders. There's also, when you look at the commercial real estate, this is any financial institution. This isn't unique to us, right? You have to take into account all of that. That's a stuck market. There haven't been transactions in commercial real estate post-COVID. Like, there's so many other macro factors here, right? And where prices, look at inflation, you know, look at the macro problem. If anything, any corporation or business has to consider that in their, their foundational portfolio and what that looks like. Then from an insurance company, we have a risk charge, how we're rated by like Moody's and everyone else. We have to keep these bands at certain percentages, right? And as valuations drop or are unknown, like, What's that commercial office space worth downtown? No one's selling any of them. No one knows right now. So you have to be extra conservative to make sure you've got your products less risky. And, you know, this is a long horizon investment period to your case. What's tr troubling about raising fund two is you're not harvesting till seven to 10 years out. You're not having returns. So how are you going to do that raise? So it's not a liquidity issue that is oversimplification, but the need for keeping more liquidity in uncertain times when there's so much volatility, it's a volatility issue. But the macroeconomic situation is demanding different balance exactly. um, than before. Yeah, and that's um, true for all anyone raising a fund right now, but then of course, it's even harder for diverse folks. Right, because all asset allocators are rebalancing right now. Yeah which means they have less liquidity. They're not having a liquidity crisis. They're responding to the macroeconomic situation by rebalancing, which gives them less liquidity for this type of investment overall. Um, so very, very real challenges. Um, which question do you go to next? Uh, what, anyone have thoughts on how to diversify LPs systematically? How to address that? We've talked about a lot of systematic approaches to investing in diverse GPs, to training up the next generation, but what, how do we think about systematically addressing the diversification of the LPs? I maybe yeah. touched on that a little bit earlier in the conversation. The approach to <laughs> attracting diverse LPs, certainly at the equity lines, is very different from the approach to attracting what I'll just call traditional LPs, you know. and. Um, you know, literally, we're having to go on specific roadshows and organize specific dinners and events that actually do, as I said earlier, have an educational component mm -hmm. because we have to start with some of the very basic questions that were asked as to the risk that is associated with these kinds of, of investments. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the, the, the risk reward ratio? Uh, how have, you know, uh, different investments in this space performed in the past? Because it's still very new. Uh, to diverse managers, this whole approach to VC. There are very few of us in the game comparatively to uh, the people who've been in the game for a very long time. And so a lot of the work that we have to do is just explain the very, very basics. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very, very different conversation from, again, some of the very traditional investors who've built up so much wealth because they've um, understood uh, pretty much how venture works and they've got to measure the game. Yeah, thanks. I love that. Okay, somebody who's maybe a first time uh, impact fund manager in the room, I'm not sure, but perhaps said, uh, you know, how do we, anybody have thoughts on dealing with this dilemma? On the one hand, you wanna look the role, keep it vanilla so that you can resonate with as many <laughs> LPs as possible. On the other hand, you wanna have a unique proposition and thesis that can differentiate you. Can anybody help that person know how they might wanna thread the needle there. I'll put it out there that one of the things that I've seen over the past couple of years has been this explosion of seed stage generalist funds that don't 
seem to have a thesis other than good vibes only, which, you know, good job for you if you've made returns on a good vibes only investment strategy. I don't know how you did it. Uh, but that's especially during this time when LPs are paying more and more and more attention to the risks involved in investing in emerging managers or even any kind of manager being laser focused on why your thesis is going to outperform and how you actually implement on that thesis is so much better than coming in saying, I'm gonna look everywhere and see the bright spots. It's like, no, man, you're not. You're not, there's just too much deal flow that's out there. There's no way for you to be able to effectively parse everything. If you believe in your thesis, that's going to come through so much more strongly and Frankly, when you're investing in a first-time fund manager, a lot of LPs recognize that even though there's prequent data to show that first-time fund managers outperform, a lot of times you realize that you're investing in a fund that is like the learning fund, and they're going to create a better thesis over time. You're really investing in the development of a firm, not necessarily that specific first-time fund. At least that's been my perspective and what I've seen yeah. from LPs so far. So other and people who are actually allocating capital yeah. can talk about that much better. Well, and maybe the summary there is that appearing vanilla it, to be appealing is a mirage. Um, it maybe right. gets you your second meeting or your third meeting with an allocator, but you don't actually want a second meeting or a third meeting with an allocator who's not going to invest. Getting to know quickly is maybe even more important than getting to yes quickly so that you don't waste your time in rooms with people who aren't going to invest. Um, so being spe my advice would be being specific, actually, it maybe gets you more no's and so it doesn't feel as good, but those no's are actually really, really valuable so that the yeses really resonate. Yeah, just like you're, you would tell your um, founders, you want aligned investors, you want aligned allocators, you want them to not just do a one and done in your first fund, you want them to stick with you, you want them to believe in you, you want them to open doors for you. So as best you can be be authentic would be my recommendation, and or multiple decks, right? You have a different deck, for, you <laughs> could know that. your audience, yeah. you know, which, you know, but as much as possible, I just echo what everyone says, know, know, your, know your allocators. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, just because we just raised, I think for us, it's like we could not raise <coughs> based on our fund one and fund two. You know, like we had our impact report, we had all our data there, but we could not raise based on that. And everyone wanted to know, okay, but what is special about you? So we had like a Venn diagram within a Venn diagram, you know, just to get to what is our sweet spot, right? Is that our gap closing thesis? Is that our like network effects, like our summer associate programs? Like what is it about us? And we really had to nail that down just to, you know, raise in a two year time frame. Awesome, thanks everyone. Come up and talk to us if you were that first time fund manager. Oh, we're not quite done, but you're welcome to clap. Um, <laughs> at least I don't think we're done. I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, is that correct? Yeah, we have a couple more minutes. Awesome. Um, so two questions I'm gonna weave together here and just would love to hear the audience answer. I, I was in a conversation on this exact topic yesterday, so I think it's a really timely one, and my guess is many of us are having this conversation. How are you defining diverse? And there's some specific questions about racial or gender. What about socioeconomic diversity? What about neurodiversity? Someone wants to know, um, you know, why you may or may not include Asian as part of your diversity thesis um, when making investments. So I know that can be sticky, but I'd just be curious to hear. Um, yeah, Claude, you look like you want to answer. I, I so I'd love to that. start with Claude. Because um, but... I, I, I've spent uh, so much time thinking about this because. Um, I'm an investor in the Fearless Fund. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard um, about the attack on the Fearless Fund and their whole approach to investing specifically only in black women and giving grants only to black women. And the way that I think about it now is I define diverse as underrepresented. And I thought it through and that's kind of like how I see it, because there's certain people who are just underrepresented, people like myself. We are just underrepresented. And um, diversity just seems a little bit too broad, because you know, sometimes in my educational process, when I'm on these road shows, um, you know, there's so much confusion between diversity, equity, and inclusion. And people ask, so what's the difference between DEI, NCSR, and ESG? So I'm like, okay. 
Now I have to kind of break it down like that. People just get confused, and I feel like people can understand the concept of underrepresented because just some yeah. people are just not in the room, and you just have to look at these websites, yeah. and they're plain vanilla, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that as a lens. You know, the conversation I was in yesterday, somebody said, well, then let's count immigrants. And I said, well, that sounds great. I, I love that. If somebody just moved here from the UK um, and comes from, you know, a high economic status, you know, maybe white man from the UK, is, is he's an immigrant. Does that count? He's, he may not be under, underrepresented in terms of people who are being um, funded. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I actually haven't looked at the stats on UK founders, but, uh, but underrepresented, I think, is a great lens. Um, anybody else? Let's see, Rena. Yeah, I mean, this is complicated with the new Fearless Fund. Um, what I'm particularly proud of is that Mass Mutual is continuing this work. We've built this work. Um, but there, of course, is a risk analysis that's going to happen as those laws change, and we don't know where it's going to go. Um, but intentionally, the roots of where this program was started was um, in response to the murder of George Floyd. So we specifically, on the fund side, which I think is you know, what most folks are into, are investing in black. Latino and indigenous-led fund, with, they have to have also significant ownership, right? So we, we look at two steps. So if you look at 4% of GPs across the US are black, Latino, or indigenous, despite those three groups making up a third of the US population. So we look for at least one third ownership in the GP of those three groups. Right, so it isn't excluding other groups, but look, because that's the ownership in the census. And then we also look by, by mandate or just by practice that their portfolio also looks like the US census. Um, and it's not hard and fast, and I, every one of our eight funds far exceeds those goals, I will say that, but um, that's how we sort of do a quick, honest filter of are you, is this gonna you know, help us with our long-term theory of change, of changing the ratio of who's funded, you know, sort of shortening the time period our diverse fund managers raise, getting more products and service out there, and then as a, a, a life insurance company, a 170-year-old company that wants to be here for another 170 years, are we seeding black, Latino, and indigenous generational wealth, right, and that commitment, and so that's really how we, we define diverse, and, but it's part of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and then we want the differentiated thesis, the alpha, all of those other things, but that's sort of the, the baseline. Yeah. Before you add on a follow-up just for Liz, would there be a reason, I am putting you on the spot, so I would normally say in casual conversation, not to put you on the spot, but, but, but I am putting you on the spot, so um, directly, would, is there Asian fund managers, uh, according to this question, say, um, represent 0.3% of the whole asset management like population in yeah. the US, would there be a reason that you didn't include specifically, not that you would exclude them, but that you didn't specifically include Asian? Yeah, it's really GPs. hard. I mean, I have to turn down so many talented people. People be excited you're swimming in deal flow, except when you're dealing with capital inequity. And capital inequity is not unique to black, Latinos, or indigenous people, right? There's a Asian folks, there's uh, women of all races, there's LGBTQ, there's a lot of different ways to, to look at this. Um, and I think, you know, we have to, we're starting with hypothesis, testis, and thesis that investing with a diversity lens matters and can have huge opportunity and returns and the pipeline exists. So we started with uh, black Americans. We have been expanding in our programs and reach, right? We started with a hypothesis testing 15 million to address inequality in capital access. We're up to 300 million in two and a half years, right? One of that second commitment was in fall 2022 and then another 100 million we announced in, in first quarter of this year. This isn't a fly by night thing, but we're building it slowly, one, one kind of uh, thesis at a time. So I would say, in, you know, that's the situation of where we're starting. It's not the limits of the opportunity uh, of using diversity as a lens for investment. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. I'd say on, this is a, a lot of top down, which is really, really exciting. On the, the bottoms up, how are we changing the future sort of makeup of investment decision makers in the country. I mean, the reason that 
we are thinking about um, diversity from a socioeconomic, from a demographic, from a gender perspective with the Sorensen Impact Institute and our VC apprenticeship program is because what we're looking to do is, is much like you just highlighted, right? Improve the representation of fundamentally underrepresented people in investment decision-making roles, or at least on the pathway to getting there. And so we are, we are and have been based at the University of Utah for the past 12 years. Um, Utah's a really white place. Like, we have to be very intentional about developing um, our relationships with uh, not just schools that are focused demographically on other populations, HBCUs, Hispanic-serving institutions, predominantly black institutions, right? Um, but we also have to be intentional about making sure that we are reaching kind of across the spectrum of socioeconomic diversity. The University of Utah's MBA program is a top 10 public school MBA program, right? That's awesome, that's really, really great. It's also when you're looking at the field of venture capital allocators, a lot of those people are going to very prestigious private universities, a lot of those people are going to even higher tier, top two or one um, public universities in the US where it intentionally looking to other organizations, other institutions of higher learning um, to build out the partnerships that we need to be able to pull more socioeconomic diversity into the conversation. Because there's a lot more that a poor white guy in a trailer park has in common with a, another uh, economically underadvantaged person of any race than somebody has if they are a black Harvard graduate who is in the top 2% of earners uh, has with somebody who shares the same sort of demographic, right? at least in terms of the problems that affect the broadest swath of the population, which is again, what we're trying to build familiarity with on the investor side to understand that these are issues, these things that make life 90% better for 90% of people are shockingly the kinds of things where you can generate massive returns, much better than making life 5% better for 5% of people. And collectively, Silicon Valley went, <gasps> <gasps> that can't be true. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, well, we are nearing the end of our session time here. Um, I've been so grateful for everybody. As I understand it, there's supposed to be 15 minutes for turnover. Is that right? I actually haven't seen your cards. We have 14 minutes left, and then there's 15 minutes for turnover? Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, so just a couple minutes left. I've got one more question here that I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to release us. Claude has an LP call he's got to take, so we want to make sure that he's on time Go for that. Uh, whoop, whoop. The rest of you, I'm sure, have things to get to also. Um, so our last question we're going to turn to um, says, how are you refining your due diligence practices to keep in mind the barriers that are faced by diverse emerging managers? How, how are you changing your processes? Uh, maybe I'll start there because yeah, it's thanks. something that um, I've, I've noticed uh, a big change in our diligence process. So as I said, our fund one, we raised it in 2021, and a lot of diligence was very much kind of virtual, right? Because it was still kind of COVID times a little bit. And now we are making that concerted effort to actually go and meet people where they are and actually understand uh, really from uh, a customer base, from uh, a real uh, kind of thesis alignment perspective, uh, chemistry check, whether it's actually happening. And I feel like this face-to-face -face IRL interaction is actually gonna help with our diligence when a lot of people were able to, were able to hide behind their Zoom screens for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's interesting, um, a lot of these distributor teams that, that, that we deal with, we're also evaluating that as well to just really understand how people understand how they should relate to each other going forward. Mm -hmm versus just being isolated uh, in these distributed teams and not actually dealing with the problems uh, that inevitably will come up. So uh, that's something that we, we check for, also from a people perspective. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's a word out there to all the managers who are thinking they wanted to focus on the future of work. Your mm -hmm. future GPs, right? Your funds may be evaluating how you're thinking about the future of work and whether they think it can be successful, right? Um, that's awesome. Anyone else, how you're changing your diligence process? 
I mean, we look at, um, we, you know, are inspired by, there's a lot of people who've been doing this work a very long time, well before corporate started coming into it, right? So level setting there, and there's a, a you know, something I personally like is due diligence 2.0, if you've ever Googled that group, it sort of really gives almost an instruction manual of how to think, and we kind of, in general, also take a look twice um, sort of approach to both our direct investments and our fund investments. Um, and more, less about diverse, but emerging managers, right? Because the thing is like, where's their track record? If they don't have the track record, what do you do? So alternatives of a lot of reference calls to founders right, two different folks, because if they can't attract great founders, so it is a little more labor up front, um, but we put, the, we put the time in. But the thing I'd love to see, actually, I want to figure out is how do we get the introverts, right? Because it's sort of this cruel irony of fundraising is a terrible experience, right? And it's also a very specific skill set. It kind of reminds me of politicians. You can be great at running, but you're terrible at governing. And so someone can be great at fundraising, but does that mean they're gonna be a good fund manager or the most you know, sort of aggressive people who meet and follow up and those sorts of things? So really thinking about, or just their background where they're coming from the vernacular, they might have an incredible lens or approach, but no one ever said, you should be a, you know, a GP and start a venture firm with your vision. So how do we start to think and source you know, for the brilliant introverts who just hate to fundraise, right? And what does that look like and how do we access them? I don't have the answers, but that's something where I'd, I'd really like to see us fig figure out and, and crack that code. Liz, I, I really wanted to riff quickly on what you said about reference calls as well, because in the beginning, we were very much just calling people uh, who were suggested by the managers or the founders, and now we kind of go out of our way to identify other people who were not suggested, but we find mutual connections and, and, and back channel that way. And I, that's been very useful because we've discovered a few things, you know? Yeah, reference calls are great. It's sort of like alternative credit scoring, right? Yeah. If somebody doesn't have that track record, how are you going to think creatively about what might be analogous to that track record? Yeah. Um, and Liz, I love what you said too about how do you find those brilliant introverts because fundraising is not necessarily a representation of doing the job in the end. And so how do we grade people not on their performance in a pitch, but instead in their, some things that make that, you know, that are really crucial to doing the day-to-day -day job of being that fund manager.